everybody and welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Gia. I'm a 25 year old lady who lives in my mom's basement and I create booktube content and also stream variety content on Twitch. This month I set out to read five books and I read four of them and I'm going to resign myself to be satisfied with that. To be completely honest with you, it is August 25th at the time that I am recording this and I have not even started the last book. Could I finish by the end of the month? Yes, but due to my upload schedule being uploaded every Friday, I have to finish this by today, which to go up tomorrow, and it's like this whole thing. I will finish the last book another time. When I was trying to come up for a title for this video, I kept going back to flops and bops, you know, toots and boots kind of thing. But the truth is, three of these were bops, and only one of them was a flop, and I'm probably going to spend most of the time talking about the flop. We started out strong in August with the selection by Kiara Cass. This is part of my series where I talked about like YA books that I missed out on when I was younger. Like it was around, it was in the same ballpark, but the train missed me. Like it, it's just for whatever reason, I did not read it. I was a divergent girly through and through and... I did not get around to reading this, so I decided to pick it up for the first time, and I actually really liked it. I rated it four stars, and the reason why I rated it four stars is because the entire time that I was reading it, I was thinking to myself, my 16-year-old self would have been screaming, crying, throwing up for this shit. Like, I, when it comes to my ranking system for how I rank books, they have their own little, like, sub-genres. Like, it's not really just, like, you can't compare like a fantasy to a romance or a historical romance to a, you know, a suspense. You can't really compare the two because you have different criteria for what makes a good romance, what makes a good suspense, what makes a good fantasy. Like there you have your own like almost uh, rhetoric criteria for what makes a good thing in that series. For those of you who have not read the book, a brief synopsis is it's kind of like a dissolved America has dissolved into kind of a caste system. There was a bit of a war a bit of a war. There was a war. What the fuck is going on upstairs? So there was a war. Very clearly like post-war America. Which happens to be the name of our protagonist. Our protagonist's name is America Singer. Singer because that's what she does for a living. So in this society, in this new America, they call it Ilia. In this new society, there is a caste system that goes from one to eight, with ones being the best and eights being the lowest, obviously. So we've gone back to a monarchy, and I have to read this because I don't exactly know. Like, it was apparent, like, who was better than who, but, like, they all had, like, different weird categories. So ones were royalty, twos were celebrities, including athletes, singers, actors and actresses, models, politicians, police officers firefighters, guards, and military members. Then threes are business people, including inventors, teachers, philosophers, scientists, doctors, veterinarians, nurses, dentists, architects, librarians, engineers. There's, there's way more. Fours were jewelers, real estate agents, insurance brokers, head chefs. That's an odd one. Construction managers, property business owners, and farmers. Okay. Fives are artists and performers. Our girl America, her last name is Singer because that's what she does for a living. Her family are all musicians or artists. Um, her mom plays the piano and then America has mastered like a million instruments and her dad is an artist. Her sister is an artist and then her little brother isn't quite sure what he wants to do yet and he doesn't quite fit the mold. They don't even know if he is like artistically talented. Sixes are workers like secretaries or waiters and waitresses, housekeepers, seamstresses, store clerks, cooks, and drivers. Sevens are manual laborers like gardeners, farmhands, or trash collectors. And eights are untouchables, which are people who are like addicts, runaways, illegitimate. There was like a big thing about being illegitimate and the homeless. So something that is is known is like when you marry if you marry someone um the woman becomes the cast of the husband so like it's always very imperative that you marry up so when we first meet our girl america she's like a five again she's like this very talented musician she's in a relationship with a boy who's a six and they want to like be together but obviously they can't because of the caste system america's mother basically convinces her to enroll in the selection which is basically the bachelor but like you become the next queen so her mom leverages 
uh, like she would earn her own money from her performances if she enrolls, at least just enrolls in the selection. And it becomes very clear that it's not a lottery. It's more of like a hand-selected process, like a sorority would pick people. America and the prince have like a bit of a weird like friend relationship. What I really liked about them is that they were friends first. And in a lot of YA, there seems to be like, there's always like some sort of tension between the two protagonists and they're not really like they don't really have the chance to be friends they're usually either enemies or they don't like each other or there's like an insta connection but the fact that they were friends first and that over time developed feelings for each other I really liked that and of course no spoilers past what I've said like via the premise but uh I liked that they were friends first and that was really what stood out to me the most and what made it like the four-star read for me personally. The next book I read in August was The Bridge Kingdom by Danielle L. Jensen. I could do an entire video on this book because I loved it so goddamn much. This was what I needed. This book is exactly what I've been hoping and praying for. Like I needed fantasy that was good. Like it was, it had decent world building. It had good character development. Like it was great. I think the strongest point in the Bridge Kingdom was the character development. And that is all I'll say about it. Because I could literally talk about this book forever. And honestly, I think I might make its own video about it. But I also want to read the rest of the series. So I think I think the Bridge Kingdom is going to get its own standalone. So I'm not really going to chit chat about it too, too much. But so the premise of this book is that there, it, it feels, it felt very inspired by like the Silk Road. So the analogy for the Silk Road being was this giant bridge that one kingdom had access to that controlled like all of the trading and everything. That was the main trade, you know, business. This kingdom owned the bridge. And as a result, all the other kingdoms wanted the bridge in the first place. And the way that it's described is like, it's very, it, the way I thought about it in my head was like, if the Great Wall of China was like Route 66, basically, with like all the care, like the all the the carts and stuff going down the wall, like it's that's what it felt like to me. But then it also later on, like the bridge itself, not only could you travel on top of it, but you could travel in it. So it was almost like you could travel on top on the roof, basically. But then it was also like a tunnel system at the same time. And it was like vaulted above the rainforest and everything. So our girl... Lara, she is the daughter of a king and they live in the desert and he has trained all of his daughters to be warriors and assassins in secret. The world does not know that these kids exist. He has like a harem uh, situation where he has multiple wives and bore him multiple daughters and so they're all this around the same age and he hid them away from the world to train them to be assassins. The point is that he is looking for one of his daughters to be married off in an arrangement to the king of another kingdom because he is looking for his daughter to assassinate this king so that he can then take control of the bridge because he is telling his daughters, like, all th he's basically brainwashing them, saying, oh, this kingdom is our enemy and we need to take control of the bridge because our people are starving. And of course that's not the true story and that's not what's going on. So I think the strongest point of this story was the character development because you had this girl who is, I think she's like 19 or 20 actually. She's, she's a full adult. She is sent to be the wife of this king who she does not know who she's believed to be a monster her entire life only to find out he's not what she thinks that he is and the kingdom that he leads is not what she thinks it is and she has to battle her own prejudices and change and realize that what she was taught all her life was not true and it was done exceptionally well like exceptionally well in my opinion and it's a trilogy there's two more books in the series and I'm really really excited to read it and like that's as much as I want to say. I know that that's super duper vague, but I do want to give this book its own video where I do like actually go into spoilers and like talk more in depth about it. But it was a five star read for me, like easily, easy, easy five star reads for me. I'm trying to be very careful with how I rate things because on Goodreads, you can't give things half stars or anything. I am trying to be very 
careful and specific as to how I am rating things. Like this was a five star read for me on a fantasy scale where this the selection was like a four star read for me in like the YA category. So it really does vary and depend on like the genre that it exists in. But at the same time, it still has to like make me feel something. No matter what that feeling is, it has to make me feel something. And the Bridge Kingdom got me so fucking excited. I started making a Pinterest board of like things that made me think about it. And maybe I'll post it. Maybe, maybe I'll post my, you know, Pinterest board. I also started making a Pinterest board for A Court of Thorns and Roses because I just, I started doing that recently. I also recently bumped up my rating for A Court of Thorns and Roses to four stars instead of three stars because I honestly thought about it and I was like, yeah, Tamlin is a very um, controversial character and I did not like him and I ranted about him for quite some time. However, disliking a character is not a reason to dock points. Like, did he suck and do a lot of bad things? Yes, but I think the point is, is that I'm not supposed to find any of that romantic. I'm not supposed to find any of that good. And the fact that I was able to point it out and say that it is bad is a good thing. So I instead chose to learn from it and say to myself, yeah, he's shown us her uh, love interest now. But as we know, she doesn't end up with him. So I was like, this is really just showing the first cracks in the glass in their relationship. So I was like, you know what? Maybe this is actually well executed. You know, like maybe this is actually good because it's not like it's 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 Tamlin developing into the love interest we should not aspire to have. Like, again, first cracks in the glass. So I was like, you know what? This needs to be a four star read. So wait, in, again, side note, you know, whatever. And the moment you've all been waiting for the flop of the century. I had so much goddamn hope for this book. I, ha I wanted it to be good so badly. A Touch of Power by Maria V. Snyder. This book tried my patience. I had to reactivate my Audible subscription to get through this book because I could not physically read it. I... I was so stuck reading it. It took me like four days to get to 23%. And when I turned on the audiobook, I went from 23% to 60% in an afternoon. And then it still took me several days to get through the rest of it. I stayed up until 4.30 in the morning to write a review on Goodreads about this book and about how much of a fucking train wreck it was because I had that much to say. The premise of this book gave me hope. The premise of this book, I wanted to root for her so badly. So we're in a world where there are 15 kingdoms. Now, a few years ago, there was a plague and the plague killed nearly everybody. Also, there are like 15 to 17 different types of magic different types of magicians, different types of magic in general. Our main girl, Avery, is a healer. Healers, it's not necessarily a magic, it's more of a like feeling, an intuition is the way that she describes it. Healers are very rare because after the plague started, the healers refused to heal the plague. So, Word spread that the healers created the plague on purpose. Okay. It should be noted that healers heal by touching you and absorbing your sickness or absorbing whatever's wrong with you. And it manifests on them. And then they heal to get rid of it. However, if your wound is fatal, the wound will also be fatal on the healer and the healer will die. But if you have a cold or a sinus infection, the healer can zap it away from you, take it into themselves, and then they have increased healing abilities that they will heal faster from the same thing that they just took from you, which is a very cool premise. However, the reason why they refused to heal the plague is because the plague was terminal. So if the healers healed the plague out of somebody, the healers would die and then the healers would die out. So they would be, they would all die anyway. So the healers refused to heal people. 
So word got around and word spread that the healers made the plague on purpose or that they were refusing to heal it on purpose for some reason. So they were all systematically tracked down and, um, you know, K-worded. Our main girl, Avery, has been on the run for like three years and she has a very defined maternal instinct where like the only reason she skips town is because she ends up getting caught because she heals a kid. Like she can't bear the thought of seeing a sick kid. So which I thought was pretty cool. Problem being also with Avery is that the only thing that's wrong about her is that she is too selfless. If that that's it, like she has almost no other faults but she's like oh my god I am so plain blah like I have brown hair and brown eyes I am so plain blah but she's little miss perfect everywhere else which doesn't make any sense so she ends up getting caught again and then she ends up getting saved from the gallows only to be like low-key kidnapped by a group of men basically like fellowship of the ring-esque band of marauders who are looking for a healer and have been looking for a healer for quite some time because their monarch is sick out of the 15 kingdoms i think only three remained and one of them was like the good guy the second was a fascist dictator and the third was a religious cult leader and they were all like leaders of their own kingdoms and all wanted to have the 15 kingdoms to themselves for various reasons i thought the theme of uniting a plague torn continent was very good however i was sorely disappointed by how poorly executed this book was the characters had the most flat personalities the most flat dialogue between them betwixt like i know that there's not many ways to say that someone said something like I said this and he said that but when it becomes so neutral to the point where there is hardly any tone conveyed in the dialogue it becomes like you're reading an academic paper it's I said this or I said that or did they whisper did they seethe were they sarcastic you know were they sad like what is the feeling behind that. And there are words that are synonyms for the word say or said that could have been used and they weren't. So like I heard this more when I was listening to the audiobook, but it still grated my nerves when I was reading it because it was just the same words over and over. Maybe it's just because when I was in seventh grade language arts, my teacher always told me that if you use the same word more than three times in a paper, it's bad. So like maybe it's just me. More than anything, like, when it has such mature and introspective themes of like political, like uniting of the political sphere and you, the uniting of a plague torn continent, like this, these are very deep themes that could have been done so good had it not been for the fact that the rest of everything else was just so juvenile. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean that in a way that this book could have been more. It could have done more. It could have been darker. It could have been deeper. It could have been more introspective. It could have been many things, but it wasn't. So you have like, I'm rooting for this concept so much. Like I want it desperately to be good. But then the execution was poor and it made me so sad I thought the magic system was really interesting. Like, I really had a lot going for it. Hardly anybody had any survivor's guilt about the fact that they survived, but other people didn't. It was very much like, yeah, my mom died. Anyway, like, come on. Like, there was no, like, why couldn't it have been me? Because there was no true way to, like, know how the plague started. But all they know is that so many people died. There were also a few points in the dialogue that had some tonal problems. So it wasn't just... Uh, it wasn't just the fact that the dialogue was flat, but when it did convey tone, there were tonal problems. So it was both flat and incorrect. The best example I wrote, I'm, I'm skimming my Goodreads review, but you can find it, um, on my Goodreads page. But the quote that I used was, I was tired of being manhandled all the time. My fear transformed into anger. Are you blind? I ask. 
Oh, that's right. You've been playing with girls so long. You have no idea what a woman looks like. In this, so in this scene, Avery is being carried around in between escape attempts, like basically like Fiona over Shrek's shoulder, being carted around like a sack of potatoes. And she says these lines. If I was under duress and essentially kidnapped, gone from the gallows to being in shackles by somebody else, by a separate captor, I would not say something that could be so easily misconstrued as flirtation because the whole you've been messing around with girls so long you forgot what a woman looks like. Not only were these words like completely out of place given the context, but the context was also like it could have been flirtatious which I didn't understand in the slightest. So that just kind of made me like go, what? Okay, anyway. Also, there's a scene where a character's sister is found dead and the morning of the funeral, it's like very sad and somber. And then the two uh, romantic leads are giving major flirty vibes and they're just like flirting with each other on the morning of a fucking funeral and like their mutual friend is heartbroken that his sister died and they're flirting at the ceremony I was like you've got to be joking me it was just very out of place and I didn't understand another thing was like This book was very heavily marketed to be an enemies to lovers romance, but the enemies part didn't make any goddamn sense. So Carrick, that's his name, kidnaps Avery with his little band of, you know, the the fellowship, if you will. He kidnaps her and he is taking her to heal his monarch who's been put in a magical sleep so that the symptoms of plague do not progress in him. So he basically kidnaps her and says that she has no choice because she's the last healer alive and that she needs to come with them to heal them and she has no choice or, you know, I guess they're going to turn her into whoever wants to kill her or something and then the healers will be extinct. So, but at the same time, we know already that if a healer cures plague, they then get plague and die. So he's making her choose between death and death at this point. Avery has every reason to be resentful, but he has no reason to be resentful because he's in a position of power. If anything, her brattiness is just an inconvenience. Him holding power over her, he can drag her wherever the high hell he wants to and she has to come with him. Why? Because he's the one in charge. The only way that enemies to lovers can work is if they're, they're fighting against an opposite cause or they're adversaries in some way. Like bickering does not make you enemies. Bickering does not make you adversaries. Like telling somebody that you hate them because they've kidnapped you is pretty normal, I'd say. He had no reason to be resentful towards her. If anything, he should have been grateful. She was, he was basically telling her to risk her life for somebody who, by the way, the monarch that he wants her to heal is the same monarch who passed around the word that the healers were the ones who spread the plague on purpose. So of course she has every reason to say no. She has every reason to say fuck you and every reason to try to escape. But he has no reason to be angry with her, especially after he found out the dirt on his friend, the dirt on his king especially after that so like the enemies to lover shit did not make any sense also in the very like maybe first 10 chapters he backhands her so hard she falls on the ground and then he shackles her to a tree and then denies her food trying to starve her out to make her agree to do it because she says yeah you can drag me along all you want but I'm gonna dig in my heels and not do what you want fuck off I may still be in chains but I'll still spit on your shoes so he tries to starve her out and she even makes a remark I couldn't find it she makes a remark about how fast her bruises were healing about how oh the bruises weren't that bad I'm already most of the way healed and you want me to root for this man you want me to root for this relationship 
I don't fucking think so. Especially like when she first meets him, like I knew he was going to be the love interest, but like when she first meets him, it's very, because it was first person. We're getting her, we're getting Avery's perspective, not his. When they first met, she was like, oh, he smells like pine needles and sage. Like I knew like the second someone starts talking about what their love interest smells like, it's like, it's immediately insta lust. So she is like immediately like having feelings for him at the same time where she's like, fuck you, I won't do it. But then like after how poorly he treats her and they treat her like shit. The only reason that they value her is because she's a healer. They're like, yeah, you're important because of your powers and that's it. And I'm supposed to root for this relationship. Like it's very, it's giving abuse. It's giving domestic abuse and I don't like it. Any interpersonal conflicts or twists don't really land. There's two twists in particular where like someone is introduced to be a friendly and then they turn out to be a not friendly and like it's very obvious that they're not a friendly and that things are going to go wrong. And I saw it from the beginning. I knew on site that this was not going to go well, but apparently these characters are some of the dumbest bitches alive because they don't know when someone's being suspicious. Now moving on to the incoherence of my brain, of the bits that pissed me off the most about this. There is so much assault in this book it pissed me the fuck off so much. So remember those three monarchs I told you about? And one of them was a fascist dictator. Turns out Carrick is a prince whose daddy died from plague. And so he united his kingdom with his bestie, Rhine, who was in a deep slumber with the plague. And he wants Avery to heal anyway. All of the monarchs apparently went to school together. So they all know each other. They all went to boarding school, went to Hogwarts, if you will. Some of them are magicians. Well, like Carrick is a earth magician. And then the creepiest motherfucker alive, Tohan, is a life magician. And he is said fascist dictator. He has set Avery on the run for three separate years. And in the midst of the story, he changes the bounty on her head from bringing her dead to bringing her alive. And not, never not once do they question that. But in the midst of the story, we find out that not only did they go to boarding school together, they all kind of hate each other now. So when they were at Hogwarts, Carrick had a fiance by the end of it. Her name was Jael and she was like a wind magician or air, she was an airbender. So she was a nasty fucking bitch. And left him for somebody else because they all know each other personally i guess tohan spies kind of realized that carrick was developing feelings for avery so tohan took it upon himself to steal avery for himself by force so he changed the bounty on her head to bring her dead or i will double the prize if you bring her alive because he wanted to steal Avery from him and his reasoning was that Carrick's dad the king of his own kingdom used to visit him in school and in general was a good dad and then Carrick got a fiance who was like this gorgeous airbender and Tohan dead ass said he can't have a caring good dad and a beautiful wife. It's just not fair because my daddy didn't give a fuck about me. He can't have everything. So, be and then the fiance was stolen away by somebody else. So he stopped caring about that. But once he found out Carrick had feelings for Avery, he decided to take her by force. So he ends up with her alive and then uses his powers as a life magician to every time he touches Avery, he would manipulate her emotions and manipulate her body to feel differently than she actually did where her brain was saying no I don't want this get the fuck away from me but her body was saying otherwise and he was forcing himself on her to try to convince her that staying with him was the best option like 
from a winner's perspective, from a conquest perspective. But then it was also like this like personal vendetta against Carrick because of Toan's fucking daddy issues. But what really got me is that it wasn't just the daddy issues. It was the lengths that he went to ensure or try to ensure that Avery would choose him over Carrick to try to win for some reason. So like, for example, he not only touches her without consent and then uses his powers to manipulate her to feel differently than she does because she thinks that he is gross and creepy and wants him to get the fuck away from her, but he puts her up in rooms that are adjacent to his and connected by a secret tunnel just in case and then he also makes her accompany him to events where she's dressed up and she's practically naked there's a scene in which she's uncomfortable with the dress he picked out so she tries to wear something else and he comes in on her while she's changing and gets extremely visibly angry when she's not wearing the dress that he wanted her to wear He's portrayed as this very hot and cold person who can turn on a dime and become very angry within a dime. And it was like a walking on eggshell situation where you didn't want to make him mad. But the assault is what got me. It made me so goddamn angry. I had to stop listening to the book for about a good half a day. It was terrible. And I hated every goddamn second of it. And then... Carrick comes to rescue Avery and they like kiss and she heals Ryan, but she somehow survives from the plague. But like in no way, shape or form were either of these men good options. They were terrible. So if I was supposed to enjoy this as a fantasy romance, the romance was so bad and so full of domestic abuse it made me sick and I hated every second of it and then on top of that you have a concept for a book that honest to god is so good the concept was so good I was rooting for her only to turn out so poorly executed that I can barely stand to finish the book Again, I had to reactivate my Audible subscription for this shit. And I'm going to keep it this time. But, like, I was rooting for her. And she let me down so hard. And I had to buy this book. This wasn't even on Kindle Unlimited. I spent, like, $2 on this book. And I thought to myself, like, oh, if it's a three-star read, like, it's a good $2 spent. It earned two stars. And only because I was rooting for the concept. The second star is for the fact that I was rooting for the concept. You know, if the concept was bad, it would have been a one star. Like if everything about it was bad, it would have been one. But because the concept was good and I was rooting for her and maybe in the next books afterwards it gets better. Like that maybe you get more exposition or you get more about the world. Like maybe it gets better. But like... The world and the and the concept is what earned it its second star. But besides that, horrible. And after reading that, after finishing The Bridge Kingdom, which was a five-star read for me, I was so disappointed. It was such whiplash, and I didn't want to read it. I wanted to read the second book in The Bridge Kingdom series instead of A Touch of Power. That's how much it pissed me off from the beginning. The fourth and final book that I finished in August, I read it in one day. And honestly, it cheered me up a little bit. It was Twelfth Night's Bride by Elizabeth E. Watson. This book was kind of cute. It, honest to God, warmed my spirits a little bit. It is about our girl, Eilina. And she is a part of the clan Grant. This takes place in the 1540s, I believe. So it's Outlander-esque time. About two generations ago, her family's home was raided by another family the McDonald's, and ever since se the several generations down the line, the Grants and the McDonald's are enemies. The Grants are also starving, and now it is Yuletide. It is Christmas. I think the book starts on like Christmas Eve or the day before Christmas Eve or something. So 
The Grants are starving, and Eilina is not like other girls, and she goes out and she steals vegetables from the McDonald's. Now, this doesn't sit too well because she gets caught. So the McDonald's are hot on their trail, and then she lies and says it wasn't her. Well, then they find out it was her. So the laird of the McDonald's, his name is James. She calls him Jamie at some point. He's hot as fuck, and they have never seen each other. Immediate insta-lust between these two. I think they were 19 and 25, and I'm 25, so it was a, you know, my age bracket-ish, at least for the dude. Immediate insta-lust between the two, like immediately. Like he chases her down, and they realize that they've never seen each other in person, and that they hate each other because their fathers hated each other, and they have actually never met. So... James ends up going into the Grant's land to say, okay, you stole vegetables from me. What are we going to do about that, sis? And hello? We have a visitor. So Jamie and Seamus, the brother, are trying to figure out, like, what can we do about this, sis? Your sister stole vegetables from me. Like, what are we going to do? And Seamus is like, I don't know. I don't have anything to give you because we have literally nothing. And we're waiting on the king to, you know recompense us for the fact that you stole shit from us two generations ago and now we're starving so the royal messenger from the king has not come yet jamie has a wild card up his sleeve because apparently this was a big secret he was a bastard child his father went outside of his marriage and conceived conceived him he was the only son and so when the lairdship passed to him his stepmother was very very upset about it that it passed over her two true born daughters who were older than jamie so he was a bastard he got the lands but he, and he got the title but he didn't get his personal inheritance and the stepmother excuse me ma'am no I, 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 stop step back the stepmother locked up his personal inheritance behind several criteria one of them had to be that he had to i think the main criteria actually was that he had to marry a grant woman before his uh 25th birthday which happens to be on the same day as 12th night which i guess is like a yuletide thing i don't actually know like the holiday of yuletide and how it all works but there's like christmas and then christmas day and then the 12th night is like after the new year so his birthday was 12th night. So he had like only 12 days until time was up to have a grant wife and then he would lose his personal inheritance. So this is a big fat secret. So when he's presented with the opportunity because Eileen stole vegetables from him and he looks at her and goes, oh my gosh, she's so hot. Maybe I could actually love her. He says, all right, you stole vegetables from me? Word, I want you, one of your sisters to marry me. And in a roundabout way, it ends up being Eilina because she thinks that, like, he's going to be the worst person ever. So she wants to save her wallflower of a sister from the horror. So to make a long story short, they have 12 days and they have this marriage that may or may not be permanent. Like, she has to decide to stay with him by the end of 12th night and, like, if she doesn't stay with him, he doesn't get his personal inheritance, but he doesn't care about that. He cares about his honor, about whether or not she wants to stay. Like, he genuinely wants her to stay. So, it's basically 12 days they fall in love over Christmas. And honestly, it was cute as hell. Like, was it insta-lusty? Yeah. Do I hate that? Usually. But sometimes... Sometimes it just slaps. And after a touch of power, it was exactly what I needed. It was like a little cleanser. It wasn't that long. Like, again, I read it in a day. I read it in just a couple of hours. Like, it was a little teeny tiny cleanser to after reading a really bad book. And it was exactly what I needed, honestly. Like, right, Poppy? It was what we needed. She agrees. And I also rated that book four stars. So at the end of all, it all, we had... Two four-star reads, a five-star read, and a two-star read for the month of August, which it could have been worse. It could have been worse, but A Touch of Power really disappointed me, and it was difficult to get through it, and it was probably one of the reasons that I did not finish my TBR list for August. I'm not going to be too harsh on myself, and I'm not going to force myself to read a fifth book 
only for this wrap up to also be late because I don't want to do that. Like I'm trying to keep a schedule. So I'm just going to admit that like one of the books did not slap as hard as I thought it would and it caused me to fall behind and that's okay. Shit happens. So yeah, that is where we wrap up there. I am going to get started this week on September reads. I think I'm going to get started on my secret TBR in the background and then also work on uh, start working on my September reads and start to get a little bit ahead and see where it falls after that. Starting in September, I'm going to start doing themes just to kind of categorize, especially my Kindle Unlimited list, just kind of start to categorize the books that I read because it's very hard for me to like read different books when I bounce around in genres all the time. So September is Historical Romance Month and four of them are Regency Era and the fifth one is the Conquering of Wales era. It's the 13th century. So four Regency, one 13th century. And the outlier, like you'll hear me talk about it in the September TBR, like I did a bunch of mental gymnastics, but in the end I was like, this book still sounds good. I'm going to read it anyway, like whatever. But yeah, that is all from me. So if you'd like to find me anywhere else, you can find me on Twitter and on Twitch at Huntress Gia. It's the same as my YouTube name. Poppy also says goodbye, even though she should not be touching my microphone. My microphone has a little bit of cat hair on it, if you haven't seen already. I don't know why she thinks this is all about her when it's, you know, it's the Gia show. But yeah, thank you so much. If you got to the end of this video, I really hope that you choose to stick around. Remember to drink water and be nice to each other and exude kindness and empathy with everything that you do. And again, if you'd like to find me anywhere else, Twitter and Twitch at Huntress Gia. And Poppy and I will see you in the next video. Bye!